Back when Apple introduced Apple Silicon at WWDC 2020, they also launched a DTK, a Developer Transition Kit, so that devs, the makers of your favorite apps, could move those applications away from Intel to ARM. Now, the DTK was kind of a weird rigmarole of hardware. It was an A12Z iPad processor inside of a Mac Mini chassis, which frankly seemed like the perfect case to use in the interim, at least, you know, before unveiling the real Apple Silicon computers. However, when the M1 computers debuted later that year, the Mac Mini retained its same form factor, the same case that it had used since 2010. Now, make no mistake, the new Mac Mini was powerful and packed a major punch compared to its predecessor. But when compared to the fanless MacBook Air that had that same M1 chip, well, many people figured that Apple could have done better. Now, there's a variety of reasons as to why they might have retained the same form factor. It could have been to set an impressive benchmark for the new Apple Silicon using, you know, a case that we're all familiar with. Or it could have been that just redesigning a low volume product like the Mac Mini wasn't worth it. Especially considering that the Mac Mini's main customers, the education and enterprise market, have spent a lot of money accommodating a now 12 year old design. Maybe it was just as simple as wanting to wait for a complete redesign say 2022. Whatever the reason, I've wanted to see if I could reduce the footprint of this machine for well over a year. So let's open it to find out if we can. But not before I open this segue to our sponsor, Aura. I've been an Aura customer for six months now and I am in love with this product. It's this normal looking high-end ring. I even replaced my Cartier wedding band with it, but it's jam packed with tech. From heart rate to advanced temperature sensors, the ring tracks your vitals accurately and consistently. Though it monitors you during the day and during fitness, I love how well it tracks my sleep. Look, I'm not about to fall asleep with a stupid smartwatch attached to my arm. And even if I didn't mind doing that, well, Aura just frankly does a better job than anything else out on the market anyways. It tracks my heart rate and my variability, as well as my body temperature, my sleep cycles, and so much more. But beyond the wealth of data that frankly I find a little too much, <laughs> Aura actually gives me actionable guidance, such as, hey, you know what? You didn't really sleep very well last night. Make today a recovery day, don't work out that hard, and maybe go to bed around this time. With no screens or distractions and a seven day battery life, Aura has naturally become an extension of myself and has removed hassle and stress, something that other alternatives have not been able to match. Get your Aura today with a six month free membership by using the link in the video description. So crack open your wallet and I'll crack open this Mac Mini. Popping off the plastic cover and component shield reveals a very familiar looking Mac Mini. In fact, save for a little bit of spare room inside due to a shorter logic board, you would be excused for mistaking the M1 with the 2018 Intel Mac Mini. And that's because the M1 is mostly comprised of components from the old Mac Mini's parts bin. <laughs> the largest of which is this hilariously overkill 150 watt power supply. Now, the previous Mac Mini, they offered it in a 70 watt TDP Intel Core i7 variant. And so rather than redesign the whole power supply for the M1, Apple just, uh, they didn't. <laughs> the same holds true with the cooling assembly that uses a blower fan to suck air in through the bottom of the machine, pushing the cool draft through the aluminum heatsink fins that sit atop the M1's internal heat spreader, and then exhausting the hot waste heat out of the back of the machine. With these monster components removed from the case, we're left with a very svelte logic board that has all of its IO soldered directly onto the PCB. However, it is attached to a rather wide plastic IO shield that houses two of the machine's three wireless antennas. Oh, we've also got our power button there. So the question becomes, well, what can we do to shrink this machine? Well, first let's get rid of everything that we don't absolutely need. We know that the M1 is efficient and doesn't necessarily need a fan. See the MacBook Air. However, many machines, they're not gonna boot with a fan attached. So let's give it a shot. And success. Not only does the machine run totally fine, but there's basically no loss in performance either. So long as we leave the IHS and heatsink attached. Now, as for the antennas, these are all wired. So there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to harvest and relocate them. First, we less than gracefully remove the bottom antenna. <laughs> there is a screw hidden behind a plastic shield that's applied with adhesive. So get that adhesive good and melted, unlike our, well, less elegant method of removal. As for the other two antennas, they're both just held in with a few screws. So removing them from the rear IO shield is very easy. 
Now that does require us to also remove the power button, which is unfortunately plastic welded into place, but using a soldering iron to melt the plastic uh, and remove the board is not too tricky. You'll also wanna remove the associated ribbon cable. We're gonna relocate all of these components later, which basically just leaves us with this super wide plastic IO shield that we can now ditch, it serves no purpose. Okay, let's address the elephant in the room, and that is the power supply. The power supply has this gnarly 20 pin connector attached to it, which looks very intimidating. However, if we use a multimeter, we find out that it's actually really simple. Seven of the connectors send a 12 volt DC load to the board, seven of the connectors return zero volt, and six of them are not connected. Now you might have the question, well, why use a connector with 20 cables instead of two if it's in essence just a positive and negative 12 volt lead? Well, the answer is stability and safety. If we take the Mac Mini's 150 watts and divide that by 12 volts DC, that gives us 12 and a half amps that this power supply has to carry across our wires. Now, while two thicker wires could theoretically do the job, multiple thinner wires are not only more flexible and less expensive, but they also serve to provide the same quantity of amperage with more consistent voltage delivery, which is really important for computer components. Additionally, more wires are more helpful for overcurrent protection, which can detect uh, you know, component level shorts, which prevent melted wires and fires. I knew the 150 watt power supply was overkill. I mean, the total M1 Mac Mini power draw from the wall is like 28 watts max on its own. And even with every IO port tapped out maximum wattage, you're still not even close to half the 150 watts that the original power supply can provide. But look, I was out of my depth at this point, and so I sought help from Mike of my Giver computer. He's known for these Mac Mini DC conversions, which are really cool, and a bunch of other quirky and weird, but super handy hardware power components. Now, he graciously offered to help, and I immediately poo-pooed the easy solution, which is just a DC barrel plug and a power supply because I wanted to make this Mac Mini different, maybe even USB-C capable. Mike found this cool USB-C PD board which negotiates the handshake with chargers, and it, it did work, but unfortunately, at 12 volts, the USB-C PD spec tops out at about 3.6 amps, which is not quite enough wattage to keep our Mac Mini happy. Now there are 20 volt uh, USB-C PD chargers out there, but that would require a massive hot buck converter that we'd have to make room for inside of our Mac Mini's chassis. And ultimately, I mean, the main goal was to make this thing more mini, not USB-C. So then I came across that the next Mac Mini is rumored to have MagSafe. And I figured, hey, <laughs> uh, let's beat Apple to the punch. Mike bought a MagSafe 2 board from a 2015 MacBook Pro. Uh, those can support up to 87 watts, which is more than we need, so perfect. Unfortunately, we could not use the official Apple adapters because those establish a fairly elaborate handshake with the actual MacBook before beginning to charge. So Mike wired up this beautiful abomination that would make Steve Jobs roll in his grave. It's a 65 watt, 15 volt Microsoft Surface adapter that terminates in an Apple MagSafe 2 connector. Now, while this ditches Apple's handshake method, it's still quite safe because the Microsoft Surface charger has smarts of its own. And if our pins happen to short out, well, it just kicks on the charger's internal circuit protection. So here's the setup. We go from the Surface charger to MagSafe, which then goes MagSafe to our DC voltage regulator, which is inside the Mac Mini. And then, well, we just have a clean 12 volt signal going out to our Mac Mini's logic board and it works perfectly. But this monstrosity needs a case, and that's where I turn to a wonderful viewer of mine who has asked to remain anonymous because he works as a mechanical engineer for a company that shall not be named. It took us a while to figure out the minimum amount of space that we would need to relocate all of these components while considering airflow and design. We needed a semi-open case, and we figured, well, what better way to passively radiate heat than Apple's mathematical cheese grater pattern that they use on the 2019 Mac Pro? Look, I'm biased, but I think this looks exceptional. But with that said, we need to turn this CAT file into a real design. And the best way to do that is with 3D printing. Now, when you think 3D printer, you probably think of these, a fused filament fabrication printer. These take a spool of plastic, feed it into a hot end, and then extrude it out of a nozzle. 
These printers are cheap, they are convenient, and they can print in a bunch of cool materials. One of our prototypes uses a heat sensitive plastic that changes from blue to white as it gets hotter, which is so cool. But that is nothing compared to this specialty filament, which is impregnated with iron particles that we can forcibly patina and rust out to make this amazing cyberpunk aesthetic. What you'll notice on these is that even on the most well calibrated printers, it still looks 3D printed and it really struggles with our Mac Pro holes. So we turn to MSLA, Mast Stereolithography, which is a machine with a big old UV light source that cures liquid resin that's sitting inside a vat. And in between the light source and the resin is an LCD panel that masks off sections that are not actively being cured. Now the benefit is that you get incredibly beautiful injection molded looking prints with no perceivable layer lines and pixel perfect geometries, quite literally. Also, the resin isn't a thermoplastic, so it's not going to warp and deform as our Mac Mini warms up, which is a big plus. The problem with these resin printers, other than, well, you know, the resin being incredibly toxic and annoying to deal with, is that unlike traditional 3D printers, most of the materials are just well, they're really boring because people just go crazy with their post-processing, even painting their models. We didn't want to do that. And so we decided to take a shortcut that would still look good. Mix a clear, tough resin with mica powder. You've probably seen mica powder everywhere. They put it in cosmetics and bath products, jewelry, etc. It's really sparkly and extremely color rich. Now, we didn't really know what color to go with. So we printed three test cubes in our favorite colors. Uh, midnight green, space gray, and the bluest blue you have ever seen. I mean, the saturation on this is unbelievable. It doesn't even look real. It's gorgeous. And uh, Twitter said, well, we don't care about gorgeous. We want space gray. Fine. Time for the big print. Here's the deal though. MSLA printers, well, they don't typically have a very large print volume. And while our Mac mini case is tiny compared to the original, it's still way too big for either of my resin printers. So I reached out to the folks at Frozen and they sent over their massive Sonic Mega 8K. It has a 15 inch 8K resolution mono LCD with a huge 12 by seven and a half by 15 inch build volume ginormous. And it can easily fit our Mac mini case, two of them in fact, and prints down to a resolution of 43 microns, making our Mac Pro cheese holes quite literally indistinguishable from the real thing. At $1,600, this printer is not cheap, but it is a lot less expensive than the competition and even higher resolution. So frankly, it's a bargain. They're not a sponsor, but I, I really love this printer. It made this project possible and I've linked it down below. Now, once the print is completed, we have to give it a little bit of an alcohol bath and finally a UV curing session. And voila, well, not quite. I wanted to sand it down and clear coat it and make it look fancy. But look, it's time for the moment of truth. What we've all been waiting for, final assembly. We used a regular 3D printer to make all of our internal supports because A, it's cheaper and B, because well, you're not gonna see them, but C, and this is the real reason, because filament-based thermoplastic allows us to insert brass heat set inserts, which will allow us to actually screw the motherboard into the chassis, no gluing involved, kind of. Unfortunately, since the resin is not a thermoplastic, we do have to glue our internal support members to the inside of the resin case, but that's the only thing that's being glued, the case itself. So this is completely reversible. And with that done, <laughs> everything fits as tight as a glove. We just have to screw the bottom of the case together and oh my goodness, build complete. I'm a little biased, but we think this machine looks fantastic. It benchmarks just as well as the original, and it's now dead silent with an internal volume that's just 28% of its original size. Now you might be thinking, wow, Quinn, <laughs> neat computer, but how does this affect me? Well, we've already seen Apple make surprising and excellent concessions with their new MacBook Pro. The new Pro laptops are thicker, heavier, and larger than their Intel predecessors, despite using cooler, less power hungry chips. But on the plain M1 machine, well, questions are still in the air because all but the 24 inch iMac remain with their old designs. And so which of the two ways will Apple go? Will they make the Mac mini as tiny as possible and the MacBook Air as thin as the old 12 inch MacBook? Or will they retain their sizes and put in an M2 chip that's just way more powerful than we expect? Well, I estimate the former, but one thing is for sure. 
If you had told me five years ago when just about every new Mac released was being thermally throttled due to Johnny Ives' pursuit of insane thinness, that Apple would soon be making computers way bigger than they really needed to be, <laughs> I'd have laughed in your face. But here we are. If you're interested in replicating this build with your own M1 Mac Mini, well, we've left a build guide with the printed part models down below, and so definitely check that out. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, stay snazzy. See you later, folks.